Hello and welcome in. Eddie Rodosovich, George Stoy here from the Soonerscoop.com studios. And uh, obviously the news was not good for Oklahoma on the recruiting trail today. Williams Winery, uh, the number one player in the country, commits to Missouri over Georgia. As it was reported by Chad Simmons, he had some quotes up on 3.com. If you were interested in that, I'm sure that the Oklahoma fans, George, are probably not interested in that, though. We did talk to Oklahoma football players Today, as well as Brent Venables, after Oklahoma's ninth preseason practice, uh, school starts in Norman next Monday. We'll get to that in a second, though. We do want to uh, go immediately to the emergency hotline, I guess, if you will. Uh, Josh McQuishan, Soonerscoop.com recruiting publisher, uh, joining us now. And Josh, obviously, the, the question is out there. What happened with Williams Winery? This is, uh, I can't lie. I mean, this is something that even as a week ago, I thought Oklahoma was in a good spot. You know, I was, um, I, I went on vacation and my phone was blowing up like this is going well. Um, I, I was told that Oklahoma had kind of gone back and uh, made some, you know, more strides for their NIL package. And I know, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about that, in the, you know, in the group chat and those things. And it felt like Oklahoma was, was really kind of making a comeback and doing what they needed to do. But I just think the proximity, um, you know, and I guess I should say from what I gather, Missouri came back again and was kind of like, okay, yeah, we, we can really distance ourselves here. And it, it you know, I know people will say, ah, how can OU not match that bag? It's, it's just different. Missouri's kind of up against a wall. They had to make that this win had to happen for them. Um, they needed it badly and they were willing to really do whatever was possible. Um, you know, and that's, that's what happened here. I mean, I, I think Oklahoma did everything that was possible, everything you could ask of a coaching staff to win this race. And, you know, I know people won't take it seriously and I get it because I don't think it's going to amount to much, but Oklahoma is not going to give up on this recruitment. They'll continue to try and recruit Williams Ranieri. And, um, you know, if, if I'm an Oklahoma fan, I'm rooting for Missouri to, really struggle this year and you know potentially see a, a change in the uh, the staff there yeah obviously this was you know and it, it is a big thing for Eli Drinkwich as he goes into what his fourth season uh, in Columbia and you know I, th I think everybody has seen the emotion that they displayed uh, there in the coaching room but you know is it as simple as you just got to move on to the next obviously Dominic McKinley's out there David Stone is out there that's going to be a big important uh, piece for what I think Oklahoma fans feel is a little bit of a bounce back here after the Williams Winery news. Uh, there is. I mean, that, that's the nice news for Oklahoma is not just like, oh, this class can bounce back in general, but the defensive line class can still be as good as any defensive line class Oklahoma has signed. And I think that even includes if they weren't to land Dominic McKinley. You, you know, if your class is Jaden Jackson, Wyatt Gilmore, and then you throw in Nigel Smith, Danny Okoye, and David Stone, sure. who – I think Oklahoma leads for each at this point in time. And if you could land all three of those with what you already have, that's an outstanding defensive line class. That is multiple guys that are projected, not just be NFL types, but to be good NFL players. So, I mean, that, that's what, and that's what you need, especially as you head off the SEC next year. So you mix those guys with PJ Adabare. I know, you know, talking to you guys and hearing from some other people, Ashton Sanders is off to a nice start. So th there's a lot to, say, okay, you're starting to rebuild that room. You're getting it to where it needs to be. But again, I mean, what this does to me is put such an emphasis on those guys. Now, you really don't have much margin for error. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody should say, oh, they've got to get Dominic McKinley or that's a, you know, it's a failure of a class or something because I think that's just setting unrealistic expectations. He's kind of like, uh, kind of like Winery is. I think I would have said Winery is a little bit more of a pivotal piece, but to me, McKinley is a bonus. Stone is the one you have to get. You have to get Okoye. You have to get Nigel Smith. You've got to do that because it's not every year that you've got this many guys that are geographically well-located for you to have a big-time defensive line class, and when that happens, you have to seize it. Josh, I feel like a lot of fans probably have some PTSD back to the Hicks decision last year. Um, I know that, mm -hmm. that things have been melting down, I, I would say, a little bit on the board. But what needs to happen for OU to land some of these guys? You mentioned they, they're, they're in the conversation, right? And that's 
that's better than where they were a few years ago, and they are landing more talent up front. But to land a David Hicks or a William Swinnery, what is it? Is it performance on the field this year? Is it you know more NIL? I know OU stepped up their NIL game. I know I, no, people don't want to admit that, but they got a lot of recent recruitments because uh, or commitments because of that. So what is it do you think they're just missing right now to get these guys? Or, is, or are Hicks and Winery just two odd cases? I think they are two odd cases, but I also think you have to acknowledge that there are two ways you can go about this. And I think we know which one Oklahoma has to choose under its current regime because it fits what they believe in. And the first one is go crazy with NIL. Just really start throwing money and big money at the – the elite guys. Um, I think, like I said, that we know Oklahoma is not going to go that way. That's not what Brent Venables believes in. And I, I don't want to make it out to be, Oh, they're not doing their part. They, they made a very substantial offer for um, Williams and Aries. So I, that kind of leads into what I'm saying though, with Williams and David Hicks, two local schools just threw out unbelievable numbers. I mean, just almost, unreasonable and then really probably I would guess in their classes will probably be the top dollar at their position that any player got I mean I, that that's kind of the way it is um last year Jimbo needed a win David Hicks gave him a win that he needed um this year Eli Drinkwitz he needs something to build that momentum again Missouri just landed the number one player in the country and their class jumped all the way up to number 40 yeah, like, I mean, just tells you how spots. pivotal they, they, they jumped 17 yeah, spots I mean, on top like, of that, even. Yeah, to get exactly. up. To I mean, and uh, yeah, the, uh, for him and all the things he brings to a recruiting ranking or a team ranking, it got him all the way up to 40. I mean, that tells you where it's been and what they're doing. And it's again, why they're making a big run at Ryan Wingo too, because he gives them that same kind of bump. Um, what I, what I think is the more likely outcome that is going to be successful for Oklahoma is to have success in the field. You're going to have to start showing some, you know, some development. I mean, I know, I, you know, reading some of the things you guys are talking about from practice, the defensive line is showing growth. I mean, there's some reason to believe that that's going to be better this year. Uh, obviously better with depth, numbers, all that stuff. And I know you guys will get into that here in a little bit. But you, you've got to give these guys a reason to believe because they know what Todd Bates and uh, Brent Venables did at Clemson. But at some point, you got to start doing it in OU Jersey. And the farther you get away from that, the less that tends to mean. And I, I think that's that's just going to be pivotal. But I, I, I will say to people, the thing to remember, and I've said this since Brent arrived, he didn't go to Clemson and suddenly start landing top 100 guys. That didn't just happen overnight. They built slowly. They got three stars. They found guys like Grady Jarrett that nobody else was that crazy about. And who's now, you know, a borderline Hall of Famer. I mean, like having a great career with the Falcons. So it's not the fact that OU's in on some of these battles shocks me. I never thought they'd be here this fast. So they're doing a lot of things right, but I get it. I mean, it only matters where you finish. So Oklahoma's got to find a way around some of these things. But, you know, it's it's like I said earlier on the message board with uh, or on on Twitter with with something like this. You can't afford to miss David Stone. You you've got to make that a pivotal piece, and that and that's maybe that's a good thing for Oklahoma fans. Something they can feel good about because after a loss like this, I, I feel like you're going to throw the kitchen sink out. How surprising were uh, the comments coming out of Kansas City today talking about uh, Williams Winery? He went on record with Chad Simmons talking about Georgia being mm -hmm. the team that he selected uh, Missouri over. How surprising is that to you uh, considering the movement that we had seen here over the last couple of weeks? And it seemed like almost all summer Oklahoma was in good position with Williams. Well, it's crazy because, you know, my first thought when you say that, Eddie, is I'm shocked. And I said it all along. I've been saying it for weeks. Nothing out of Georgia, Oklahoma, or Missouri would shock me as a final decision because I can I can get my head around all those choices and why he would make that. But to hear that Oklahoma wasn't in the top two just stuns me. I mean, I'll, I'll just be perfectly honest. That that is, and it it's not only just a read on the situation, but talking to people around um, Missouri, talking to people around Tennessee talking to you know so the sources we always talk to around Norman, it was OU and Missouri to all three of those programs. That's how they read it. Georgia was the only one that thought Georgia was in the top two. And, I mean, uh, uh, we've 
there's been some conversation on the board, and I want to give it up to Rusty Manziel and those guys. I mean, if that is if that is to be taken at face value, which I, again I know people keep coming up with these conspiracies, well, it can't be true because of this. The kid said it. Like I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what you want. Like I mean, at some point you have to accept reality, and I'm saying that as someone who that quote makes wrong. So like I, I'm acknowledging that reality. Um, so you know you can spin that however you want to, and I don't feel. You know, he said this because of whatever. I keep saying that sounds like, you know, um, like movie fan fiction. Like people want to believe that OU was in the top two. So what he said doesn't really matter. It was, you know, Eli Drinkwitz is, you know, he's got a puppeteer and he's willing to tell Georgia, you know, or say Georgia. Coaches aren't Machiavellian like that. They don't have, to, they're, they're doing their own thing. So I, I just, I, I struggle with that, but I absolutely was surprised. I, Similarly, was surprised by twenty four seven. Steve Wiltfong reporting that uh, you know they had he had told uh, Missouri like two weeks ago that he was in the boat, and I, you know, it, it's one of those things. It feels like the Owen scenario where there were a lot of different people with a lot of different opinions on how this should go. Is it? It's a, it's a gut punch. Oklahoma obviously getting the number one player on campus. That's you know everybody's objective. Is it as simple as moving on, though? I, they're going to continue recruiting Williams Winery, but you have to start focusing on everybody else, or else you might lose out on a Davis Stone, or you might drop the ball with a Nigel Smith. Is is it as simple as that for Oklahoma moving forward? Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the things about this staff is you've got a guy with Miguel Chavis. I mean, you guys know him. This isn't going to knock him off his stride for a second. Like he just, sure. he doesn't operate like that. He, he'll he focus on, we go, go get Danny Okoye. We go get Nigel Smith. We go get David Stone and we're going to be fine. You know, like that, that's, that's 100% how he'll see this. And that's how you have to handle it. That's how successful recruiters do handle it. They're, they're just going to keep moving forward with the guys they need to, to reel in. And again, I, I wouldn't be shocked at all. If Oklahoma takes a look around at some committed guys, um, I, I mentioned last week the Benedict Yume kid from um, uh, that's committed to Stanford, the Canadian kid. With all that's going on at Stanford right now and how amiss that all looks, and you know, m- maybe he'd be very open to something like the offer that was made to uh, to Williams Winery. I don't think he's going to command quite that that sort of capital, but I, I would guarantee it's more than Stanford's given him in NIL. So um, I think that's an interesting possibility. I again, and that's just me connecting dots. I don't want to say yeah. that I'm reporting that they've, they've reached out or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you know, you do that. And then again, the experience of guys like Brent Venables, Todd Bates, they've been through these fights. They know what this looks like. They've, they've, they've seen guys, I mean, go, you know, I, I can remember covering Brent Venables back in the early two thousands with like the Antonio clay saga where he switched commitments between Clemson, Georgia, and I can't even remember who the third school was, like four times in a matter of two weeks. Like, Brent knows, man, you just do the work. Like, you just keep going at it. You keep chasing them. They're going to continue to talk to Williams and Ari. That's not going to go away until they, re- you know, until they think that's just a, a dead story. And who's to question them after Peyton Bowen last year? I mean, they fought till the very end, and it paid off for them. So, I, like I said, I, I think I know people in this moment are not going to want to hear any of this. It's going to be okay. Um, now, if we're doing this pod in 10 days' time, 12 days' time, and David Stone has picked somewhere else, okay, I might like start letting you uh, sound the alarms. But for now, I don't have any reason to think OU can't have a very, very good defensive line class. Well, and I, I think that that's kind of the resounding theme here is that you look big picture – and I, I know that we want to talk about Jaden Nickens here in a second, who committed over the weekend to Oklahoma, the 2025 class. I mean, you if you read the interwebs right now or you read the, the message boards, you would think that Oklahoma is coming off of a season in which they did go 6-7 and seven and finished with the 50th ranked class in the country. There's still a lot of positive momentum there. And, you know, it's a gut punch. I was about to say obviously. I'm not going to say obviously. But – you got to look at a bigger picture here. And, you know, I, I think that that kind of leads into what Oklahoma is doing in 2025 as well as 2024. I mean, it, it's still a solid class. They have to start hitting on the defensive linemen. I don't think that there's any doubt about that. But at the same time, big picture, George, it seems like things are progressing in the right direction 
for Oklahoma. And if we want to get into the Jaden Nickens while we have Josh here, uh, that was obviously a big commitment over the weekend and just a ongoing effort that uh, Emmett Jones has been able to put together with that wide receiver room and what he's done in 2024, kind of rebuilding with a guy who sounds like it's coming on and Andrell Anthony, as well as 2025, uh, you know, very obviously with Kevin Sperry already in the mix and then Elijah Thomas and Jaden Nickens now at wide receiver, as well as Grayson Harris. But we're talking about Oklahoma guys. Yeah, guys, I mean, you, uh, I, I'm going to have to start associating with the 2026 wide receiver class. Like, it, uh, Emmett Jones is almost done. Yeah. Like, it's just unbelievable what he's put together. And it, I mean, in two, and not like one of these classes with two or three guys. I mean, he's got five in 2024 and he's already got three in 2025 and probably one spot left. And I think we all kind of assume, and I know I've got a prediction in that that's going to be Isaiah Mosey, um, you know, the, the younger teammate of Williams and Airy. So I think there is, there's so much credit to be paid. And guys, the thing I can't get over is with Jaden Nickens. I mean, people, you know, I know he talked about it and you guys had the video up, um, of him talking about, you know, kind of being an Oklahoma fan and he knew that's what he wanted to do. But people that haven't followed recruiting for a long time, Millwood has been a bloodbath for Oklahoma through the years. I mean, and some of it was their own doing. Some of it was, um, you know, just just a tough loss that happens from time to time. But there was, um, there was a time when people would tell you, OU's not going to win a Millwood anytime soon. And I, I never really agreed with that, but there <laughs> excuse me there's a lot of history to support that and so for Oklahoma to go in there and get him and not just you know oh they they got him going into his senior year they got him when most guys commit Emma Jones convinced that kid hey man you don't need to waste your time for the next year and a half like you know what you're doing you come in with us you, you know you're going to be part of this 25 receiver class that looks to be really special and again it makes you look forward to what next summer is going to look like. Because, I mean, we saw all these guys. We saw them all work out and go. Grayson Harris was there. You know, Elijah Thomas, Jaden Nickens. They all worked out. And even, you know, I'd have to go back through in the 24 group, but that's pretty close to a unanimous group as well. Um, I know Zion Reagan, Raggins wasn't there, but I want to say the rest of the group was, if I think about it for a second. But regardless, um, it's a – we told everybody when OU made that hire, it was a huge hire that he was really going to establish things. But we talked about Dallas. We talked about DeSoto, South Oak Cliff, Duncanville, all those places where he was going to open doors, and he 100% has. But he's done a much better job beyond that area than I even expected. Josh, I mean, everybody's talking about Emmett Jones. I, I want to ask you about Kevin Sperry, their recruiter, because him being in Oklahoma, and you've talked about the 2025 class being one of the better classes in the state of Oklahoma in a long time. How big is it to have Kevin Sperry in town? I know, Eddie, you were you saw him at the Jaden Nickens uh, commitment. He continues to blow me away just as far as like what he, how just kind of around he is. Yeah. Whether it's at camping at every single session of Brent Venable's uh, summer camps, whether it be getting together and throwing with Jake Roberts, who I want to talk to Josh here in a second about, or Nate Roberts. Sorry. Got the brothers <laughs> mixed up. My bad. Uh, he's just always around. And he had a scrimmage uh, on Saturday that he had to come, he had to get to, and he wasn't able to stay for the entire ceremony. But he's still making an effort to go see these guys that are going to be future teammates. Yeah, it is. You know, it's one of those things where you watch, you know, watch what he does, and you're like, he's got to kind of be a weird kid, right? Like, there's, like, there's this assumption that you're like, Something strange about this, but like he is a very easy to talk to, very nice, like, but, but like a normal kid, like he, he, he somehow balances that very well, where he is very likable amongst his peers, but at the same time has a maturity that most kids his age don't have. And, you know, I, I certainly include myself. I, I was not there at that age. Um, cause guys, I mean, we talked about it all summer, how, him coming to camp was like, no way is he actually going to do this. He's not going to come to every day of camp. And sure as shit, he did. Like, I mean, he was there the whole time. And it just, it kind of amazes me the the little touches, the things he does as a 17-year-old kid or 16-year-old, you know, whatever it may be, with his age and his ability to know 
how much that means to Jaden Nickens, how much it means um, to the various guys in his class. Like, you know, when they had the um, the Sooners, uh, Sooners Under the Sun or whatever, I, I can't ever remember that name correctly. Um, but when he was there and just talking to all those guys and developing relationships, the Desan Brom kid, the big tight end from Kansas. I mean, like you go down the list and he is not just talking to these guys. He's developing real sincere relationships. And you know, it's one of those things where I I say that, I guess I haven't really thought about it on this level, but when you talk about it and then you think about the head coach, he's going to play for you. Like he's a perfect fit. Like he just makes all the sense in the world for Oklahoma. And I know talking to some people uh, around Carl Albert, he's just done nothing but impress people. I know it's easy to ride a guy, you know, that's doing all these things like, Oh, he's doing it for show. And he's, he's just this kid. I mean, this is just who he is. And um, I, I, like, I, like you guys said, I couldn't be more impressed with the way he's handled things so far. Josh, we'll get you out of here in a minute, but Eddie mentioned uh, Nate Roberts, the tight end from Washington high school. I know that you put in, I think, a flip prediction to Oklahoma. Um, I think it was a week ago now. Where do things stand with him right now? Well, so you had talked to, you know, we've talked to some people at Washington. And, you know, Ed, Eddie was out there at the spring game with me. And it was pretty clear that as much as Nate clearly liked Oklahoma, we did an interview. People can go back and watch it. Um, talking to some people around the program and kind of some various sources, it just sounded like um, there were maybe some sore feelings. You know, maybe, I don't know if, if you know, maybe he felt he hadn't been prioritized enough or what it was. You know, it just felt like maybe some other schools were putting more into his recruitment than maybe Oklahoma was at that point. And, I, you know, I'm not here to say whether that's a fair assessment or not. I just, that's the impression I got. Well, talking to, I, I just, early last week, I started hearing some whispers like, hey, something's happening here like something's something's off and i know some people I, i've heard and I, I again i've been on vacation so i haven't seen it all i've kind of seen some summaries um i know there was some talk that uh notre dame had kind of stopped recruiting him or notre dame had told him he was going to be the only tight end and and um they had continued to recruit another guy talking to some notre dame sources i don't get any impression that notre dame had cooled on him i don't get any impression that they were recruiting another tight end. The, the kid that I believe that this was connected to is a Notre Dame legacy that I believe Notre Dame's uh, you know plan at the time was to play the defense. They, they liked him on the defensive side of the ball. Now, whether Nate misread that or not, I, I don't know. Um, again, I, I can't say that I understand all the variables in the scenario, but I don't think this was Notre Dame messing things up. I think Oklahoma – really started to put some work in and um and made a big impression on him and i i don't know when he might flip but i have heard a few conversations i know um you know our, uh, mike singer from our notre dame site actually put in a prediction for the kid i'm talking about um I, I actually i believe it's the kid i'm talking about the notre dame legacy uh made a flip prediction or not a flip prediction but a commitment prediction for him today I have heard some whispers, some people that believe that if Nate hasn't informed Notre Dame, he is going to decommit, that it should be coming fairly soon. Um, I Again, I don't want to say that's a fact, but I, I've talked to enough people that it sounds fairly credible. Um, at that point, I don't know if he announces it and he flips at the same time. I don't know if he'll just kind of back away from it and take some visits this fall or what it will be. But my impression is very much his Notre Dame – you know, even as a, you know, a public presentation of a commitment is probably not long for this world. Well, it's not a good day for Oklahoma recruiting, but it sounds like there, uh, there are some positives in there. Uh, I don't know if that's sunshine pumping, but it is a reality. I, you know, don't stay on the interwebs too long because they'll have you leading led to believe that, you know, this whole thing is coming to an end rather quickly. That was a good therapy session from Josh. We, I think it was. We appreciate well, Josh coming on here and giving some good therapy <laughs> talk. It, it's it's just so funny because it like I feel like when the fans are the most negative, I'm like this is going to be okay. And then sometimes we're like, oh, we're getting everybody. I'm like, calm down. Like <laughs> I'm always on the wrong side of the fence. Like I'm never where they want me to be. Well, at least you're not dead in the water, you know. <laughs> All right. 
Josh, we appreciate it. Uh, we will talk to you again on Wednesday as part of the unofficial 40. I'm sure that we'll dive back into the williams Winery stuff as well as uh, some of the other stuff that we've talked about today here on the YouTube program. Appreciate it, Josh. All right, guys. Later. Josh McQuishan, recruiting publisher for Soonerscoop.com on 3.com. Well, we let's get into uh, some of the practice stuff. I know that yep. we kind of teased it up at the top. This is our normal uh, practice review. We were able to go out to practice this morning. Uh, this is Monday morning. It was the third viewing session for the local media. Uh, it was a little bit of a rainy sky today yep. down in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, but uh, we were able to get through it. I, I would say it was kind of another one of those light practices. I, I, we weren't I, I don't want to say either. light. I yeah. just want to say that we didn't see a whole lot. They worked on some a lot of special team stuff. Uh, we, we saw a little bit of individual stuff, but you know, I think one guy that caught everybody's attention that while we were out there and you can add any thoughts that you want as far as what you saw today. Well, I guess let's go two things. Dalen Smothers is back with the team. Yep. There was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, recapping everything that went through the, uh, the scrimmage on Saturday. We'll get into plenty of that here in a moment, but, uh, Andre Anthony sounds like he continues to make a name for himself, George. Yeah, no, he's a guy that sounds like he stood out in the scrimmage. I think had a couple touchdown catches, um, a, a one really long one, I think 40, 50 yards down the field, uh, a guy that can stretch the field. I asked Brent Venables about him today. I know we'll get to that clip in a second, but um, you know, that's one of those things that I think that he's a guy that you look at, they're replacing Marvin Mims, right? It's going to be really difficult to do that. He's a guy that could stretch the field. Uh, but when you can add a guy that has the speed, and we saw it, right, the clip that everybody replays of Andrew Anthony against Michigan State, I think it was at Michigan, taking a slant, you know, 70 yards down the field. He's a guy that can stretch the field. And so if you can have someone like that and, and replace some of that production, I'm not saying he's going to go out there and have a 1,000-yard season like Marvin Mims, but he is a guy that I think can, uh, you know, stretch the field and, and, and give them some production on the outside. Andre Anthony had a pair of touchdown receptions in the scrimmage on Saturday. I believe a 47-yarder uh, from Dylan Gabriel, as well as a seven or a 49-yarder, and then a 17-yarder over the middle of the field. Uh, really nice throw by Dylan Gabriel as well. Uh, poor reports. So we did talk to Brent Venables. Here he is talking about the scrimmage, as well as George's question about Andre Anthony continued uh, impression on the Oklahoma staff. Uh, scrimmage. Uh, Saturday and it was really competitive really good work back and forth big plays on both sides of the ball and uh, really pleasing to see you know you can be mad at both sides or be happy with both sides that's a that's a great thing so incredibly competitive all good on good work and uh, still working it you know developing uh, depth charts and seeing who can play consistently and knows what to do and plays fast and aggressive and uh, developing the team. I like our, our leadership. Uh, again, great strain, uh, great competition, uh, but trying to grow, continue to grow the team up. Has, has Andrew Anthony become a guy that yeah. you think you guys he's, can He's on? done well, had some big plays in scrimmage, had another big play out here today. He's gaining, gaining more and more confidence uh, every day that he practices, and Emmett's done a nice job of you know, getting him involved and teaching him and getting him to learn how to play fast, utilize his skill set. You be competitive in tough situations, you know, third down, third medium, you got to have a play, making tough competitive plays when the defense is in position, you, know, you got to make plays. And uh, uh, he's done that and as well as other guys, but and Andrew's had a nice camp too. Andre Anthony was one of, I believe, four wide receivers that had a touchdown reception on Saturday. The other ones being Drake Stoops, Nick Anderson, as well as Gavin Freeman, uh, Jaquez Petaway had a touchdown reception from General Booty as well on Saturday. Uh, but, you know, I, it, it sounds like just kind of taking a step back. Offensively, it sounds really good. It sounds yep. like Oklahoma's offensive line played really well in the scrimmage on Saturday. It sounds like the wide receivers are starting to play pretty well or at least come into form. And that kind of leads into the question of, and I think it's going to be the question that a lot of Oklahoma fans want to know, what's going on with this defense, George? Yeah, I think it's an adjustment period, right? Uh, we've talked a lot about they have some new faces up front. When you when you you look at the guys they brought in from the the transfer portal, uh, you know, a Dejon Terry, what what rotation is he getting in there? You know, is uh, Rondell Bothroyd making the impact? And I think they had some nice plays from what we understand. There were some moments. Trace Ford 
is someone that I know really stood out in the scrimmage. Had a sack on Saturday. Exactly. So he's a guy that I think they can use in, in some different situations. But I'm sure some of it is you just have new personnel out there. I mean, a Reggie Pearson, right? I think Reggie Pearson was one of the guys that got beat on one of those Andrew Anthony touchdowns. So he's a new guy in the system. He's learning things. You've got a lot of freshmen that I think are going to end up playing a Peyton Bowen, a PJ Atabare. So I, I think it's just a meshing point. And, and that's going to happen in scrimmages, right? You're going to have ups and downs from both sides. And, and Brent talked about that, that, hey, it was good competition. But uh, it sounds like the defensive line is not totally there yet. But that's also, like you said, a really good sign for the offensive line. I know they really like those five starters that they have penciled in right now. Uh, but you do want to hear a little bit more about that defensive line coming together. No doubt. Here is Brent Venables talking about his defensive line through nine preseason practices. Uh, confidence, aggressiveness, physicality, you know, consistency in that too deep, and it's never where you want it to be, but it's improved from where we were. Uh, that's, that's the biggest thing. I like watching um, guys that have really invested, that have been here, uh, for whatever amount of time, you know, I like to watch them being, you know, invested in chasing excellence and knowing that, again, I may not get there, but I like watching there's an intent that matters. And so uh, we've got a lot of guys that are straining and competing and, uh, you know, having the right mindset when it comes to, you know, every moment on the practice field, every rep, the meeting room, everything matters. So that's part of it, too, just developing a, a culture of, of you know, again, expectations and and the willingness to move the expectations in the right direction. So that's one of the things, George. I mean, you're talking about a defensive line, and you're talking about so many new faces out there. Obviously, DJ Terry is going to be a guy that I think a lot of people want to be able to contribute. Yeah. You're talking about, uh, you know, even a guy like a Jonah Luulu, who even he played a year ago, but he's moving inside. So there are a lot of moving parts. I'm still pretty confident that that thing's going to come together. I think that, you know, because they have so many bodies, maybe in the end, that's just something that you go, okay, we can work with this, even if it is going to be five, six guys, and you're not running guys out there and having to play 100 snaps a game. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's all about having different depth. And, and even going into that, Eddie, think about how many position battles they have going on. So I'm sure they're trying to get multiple guys, different looks with different players. I mean, Think uh, at inside linebacker. It sounds like Danny Stutzman is playing both the Mike and the Will. They're kind of moving him around, trying to find what is that perfect pairing for him. Is it a Jaron Canick playing the Mike, or is Jaron Canick playing the Will? And, and, and you know, Danny's calling the defense. Or is it a Kobe McKenzie in there playing the Will or the Mike? I, I think that they're, they're trying so many different things. You think at the corner position, I know Brent talked a lot about that today. Sounds like every position's open. I mean, it, I know Woody is, is the penciled-in starter, and I, I expect him to start day one, but... They feel like they have a lot of guys there. Josiah Wagner, that's a name that continues continues to come up, the true freshman. Kendall Dolby, a name nobody seems to talk about, but Brent really likes him. He's had a really good fall camp, Brent said. Uh, and then Gentry Williams. I mean, it, he's the guy that I think has the highest ceiling of that group. So you're rotating in a guy's uh, there. Safety's another spot. I mentioned Reggie Pearson, Peyton Bowen, Key Lawrence. You know, you're probably trying to get so many of those guys reps. And then, like I said, the, the defensive line and defensive end, they have a lot of bodies there. I'm sure they're just trying to find which group is their best group, who works well with each other, uh, who opens things up. You know, is it is it a DJ Terry opening things up on the edge for a Trace Ford? Those sorts of things. And so that's why you hear those things come out of the scrimmage and, and you just can't get too concerned yet. And it's one of those things, until they play a game on Saturday, uh, we don't really know what it's going to look, by, look like. But I know Brent, as a defense as a whole, sounds like he's really happy with the aggressiveness the physicality, those sorts of things. But they do have work to do, and that's what Brent Venables was saying on Monday. Uh, confidence, aggressiveness, physicality, you know, consistency in that too deep, and it's never where you want it to be, but it's improved from where we were. Uh, that's, that's the biggest thing. I like watching um, guys that have really invested, that have been here uh, for whatever amount of time, you know, I like to watch them being, you know, invested in chasing excellence and knowing that, again, I may not get there, but I like watching there's an intent that matters. And so uh, we've got a lot of guys that are straining and competing and, uh, you know, having the right mindset when it comes to, you know, every moment on the practice field, every rep, the meeting room, everything matters. So that's part of it, too, just developing a culture of, of you know, again, expectations and and the willingness to move the expectations in the right direction. Brent Venables talking with uh, the media on Monday. If there is one thing 
that I think you can say it for probably both sides of the ball, both offensive line, defensive line, at all levels of this team, Team 129, it's the physicality. And I think that, you know, when you're talking about cornerback, we talked about it before. Jay Velais talked about it. Isaiah or Josiah Wagner and uh, Kendall Dolby, they're both physical football players. And that's something that Brent Venables was asked, was asked about today, George. Yeah, I, I think there's some people out there thinking that maybe practice isn't as physical as it was a year ago. I, there was a lot of talk last year about, you know, midseason, uh, you know, the team running out of gas, those sorts of things. Sounds like they haven't really changed a whole lot. Maybe they're more efficient. I think that's the way that Brent wants to, to wants to phrase it. I'm sure they've changed up what they're doing in individual a little bit. I know last year you guys got to watch a little bit of Oklahoma drill, those sorts of things. We haven't really seen that out there this year. That doesn't mean they're not doing it. Maybe we just don't get to see it. Uh, I know that they're they're tackling in the scrimmages and it, it's it's full go. So I, I think that that's been an emphasis. And, and Brent talked about that. And uh, again, I, I think it's more about them being more efficient in terms of how they run practice more so than being less physical. Yeah, that was one of the number one things that uh, I think you asked him at local media day was yep. if you look back on year one and you're taking this into year number two, what do you want to change as a whole? And I think efficiency was the number one thing. Yeah, it's efficiency, organization, just knowing what they want to get out of each and, in, each and every individual drill and then team and then situational, those sorts of things. I think that they have a more of a, an emphasis on things that maybe they weren't going into last year as much. Here is Brent Venables talking about physicality at practice when asked by Sooner Scoop's own Kerry Murdoch today. Brent, there's been kind of some talk about your physicality in camp and maybe it's scaled back a little. Do you, you look at it that way? Is that a purpose and kind of what do you hope to get out of that? I don't, I don't see that. I mean, we have the exact same amount of live plays as we had a year ago. Um, so I, I see live as, you know, as – Maybe that's the barometer that you. But we've had the exact same amount of live plays, um, so I'm not. I don't necessarily see that. We might have less time on the field, but we've had the same amount of plays. And just being more efficient, we're getting the periods quicker, and uh, you know, a little bit more of that. But the physicality's been good. And then you know, again, the physicality as a defense, you know, we had some really good moments, and we had some moments that we fainted, you know, at at. Uh, the wrong time from a defensive standpoint. And then from the offensive standpoint, they did a good job in making you miss uh, in space, in the hole or in space. And so, uh, but I like you know, running the ball physical, offensive line, man, they're really coming along. I like that group of guys. Our backs are running with power uh, and physicality. And we're playing a little more physical, you know, in our front seven. So I think that answers the question about physicality, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, it. If you think Brent Venables is not running a physical practice, I don't think you're paying attention, right? I mean, that guy's all about that stuff. I, the clip that the football team put out today from the, to the team account was as, as, as intense as it gets. So uh, I think that the intensity of practice is just fine. Somewhat erotic, too. A little bit erotic, yes. We will be back with uh, Oklahoma coaches and players on Tuesday down in Norman. Supposed to talk to Ted Roof defense coordinator down in Norman. I, it'll be the first time that we've talked to him since Oklahoma's been out on the practice field. That will be after practice number 10. And uh, we're supposed to talk to Andrell Anthony, too, who's yep. going to be kind of an interesting interview just in terms of it seems like he continues to come on at that wide receiver position. So thank you to Josh McQuishan for joining us earlier, talking about williams Winery. Obviously, not good news for Oklahoma. I know I said it. Don't say anything. Don't tell my parents. Don't ground me or anything. Then I wouldn't be able to make it to Norman. You know what I mean? For George Stoya, Eddie Rodosvich from the Soonerscoop.com studios. Make sure you're visiting Soonerscoopstore.com for all the apparel uh, that you can see, see behind us here, as well as hitting up the promo Sooner25. Sooner for until next time, whatever. We'll see you later. <laughs>